Hey, I think it's time to start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Francesco Fernico, International Trade and uh, Custom Advisor at the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce. Um, welcome to our Opportunities uh, in Europe webinar and uh, our International Trade Week series. Um, this is the week of the Department for Business and Trade Week, and uh, we're pleased to have you today as we kick off uh, it is an exciting journey uh, exploring uh, global markets. Uh, over the course of this week, we'll be taking you on a virtual journey uh, around the world through um, a series of webinars focused on key regions, uh, including Africa, Asia, and Oceania, and the Middle East, uh, North, and uh, Latin America. Um, each session will be led by uh, our network of experts and the poor suppliers. And, uh, offering key insights into uh, each region's business landscape, uh, along with practical guidance on how um, to succeed in these markets. Uh, so today we begin with Europe, uh, a region known for its dynamic economies and diverse uh, market and strong potential uh, for UK business like yours. Um, yeah, so let's. Um, so, a quick overview of uh, our agenda for today. And so, I'll introduce you to the Chamber and the sum of the service we offer to support your business and expand it internationally. And uh, we'll hear from our first speaker, uh, Tim Werner, that will provide an overview um, of the current uh, general market climate, uh, practical tips on entering into this key economy. And addressing what makes it unique and highlighting specific strategy uh, for uh, UK companies. Tim also uh, will explore uh, broader opportunities across the continent, uh, covering way to test the market and establish sales channels and build a lasting business presence in, uh, in this country. Uh, then we'll turn to our second speaker, uh, Christopher Ludwig, our approval supplier for uh, Scandinavian markets. And Christopher will provide an economic outlook for the region and uh, explain um, why Scandinavia is a promising area for uh, UK businesses. We will highlight uh, potential sectors, uh, address common challenge for companies, and uh, face when entering this market and offer practical methods and uh, recommendation for uh, um, a successful expansion in this uh, market. And after the presentations, we'll open for a Q&A session where uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask a question uh, directly to Tim and Christopher, uh, whether about specific industries, market entry, or uh, their advice on uh, doing uh, business in Europe. So uh, here's a quick overview on uh, who we are um, as the uh, UK largest chamber. Uh, we are proud to represent a uh, uh, vibrant network of over 4,020 members uh, from a wide range of sectors and uh, business sites. Uh, our mission is to support your international journey with a range of services that open doors uh, to new opportunities for national wide and overseas. Over here, we connect with more than uh, 35,000 businesses, including 3,000 exporters and importers who are already trading around the world, uh, both within our membership and, uh, and beyond. We honor to be a multi-award winning chamber, uh, recognized for excellence in international services and campaigns. Uh, recently, we were named um, Campbell of the Year and won uh, UK SME Enterprise Award for Excellence in International Trade, that we also recognize as the best sport organization in Greater Manchester. And our social media presence help us to spread the word. We have 50,000 followers helping to raise your business profile and keep you connected with the music, uh, business community in the Greater Manchester area. We also host more than 200 events per year, uh, welcoming over those delegates and our website sees over a visitor every month. And with a global reach of uh, our global connect network links, uh, us to over six, 680 
connection and 50 partnership across public and private sectors covering more than 90 markets uh, worldwide. So uh, here's a quick snapshot of the service we offer. I start with our market entry services. Uh, our international trade team helps to identify new partners, uh, conduct market research and deliver B2B programs to uh, support your international growth. We also provide market insights and network opportunities and strategic guidance. We offer a wide range of international trade training courses, including British Chamber of Commerce accredited courses, uh, workshops, uh, free webinars, and all the signed to navigate the complexities of uh, uh, trading internationally. We also offer bespoke advice and compliance advisory services. Uh, our experience in so the advisor provide tailor support for international trade uh, compliance, including key topics such as rules of origin, classification, um, export control, and VAT. We can also provide delivery and getting pay services. Uh, we know that uh, timely payment is, uh, is uh, important when you trade internationally. So we offer service like uh, credit checks on overseas companies, heterocredic assistance and debit recovery support for any outstanding international payments. Um, our dedicated team assists with uh, uh, all the type of extra documentation, like certificate of origin, your ones and uh, legalization and apostille documentation. And to finish, uh, we are a custom agent based in Manchester and uh, we offer custom clear support for UK importers and exporters for all the sites and uh, regions. Um, our dedicated team works here smoothly and to um, any UK port and terminal, helping you to keep us down and avoid any, any delays. So we have a, a range of upcoming events. Uh, as I mentioned earlier this week, uh, webinar covered different regions. And um, I recommend you to register for any session you haven't signed for yet. Um, also, our quarterly trade forum on the 10th of this de December at our value house venue will provide uh, updates on uh, EU regulation, which is another great opportunity to uh, connect in person. Uh, you'll find more details about uh, these events in the slides. I will send you uh, for this session and all the information uh, about these events is available in our website and also in our International Trade Hub. So once again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to explore um, uh, the promising opportunity in Europe also for UK business and to learn from our experts. So I'm pleased to introduce you um, our this Peter, uh, Tim Werner. Uh, Tim will walk us through the opportunities in Germany, offering insight uh, into the German market and practical tips for UK business looking to establish a presence there. Tim, I'm pleased to hand over it to you. Thank you very much, Francesco, and, and good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as this is a relatively brief uh, context, I um, suggest to look at a few uh, topics for the 20 minutes that I have here and um, those would be a very a micro self-introduction and then uh, I would very much like to look at, at three topics. Firstly, taking the temperature of the German market right now. Uh, many of you will have heard uh, the news uh, and I would like to talk a little bit about that as a second topic. Um, and again, this is this is more an impulse because I could talk on every of these topics probably for hours and sometimes I actually do. Um, but a few concrete tips for UK companies when entering the German market. Um, and lastly, just looking at some opportunities for UK businesses when dealing on the continent. So that being said, um, just again, very briefly, who are we? Um, I have a consultancy here in Germany um, and had it since 2008. Today we have 46 people and uh, we are mainly focused on supporting um, mechanical and engineering companies and some B2B service companies uh, into the German market. 
Um, and we do that by very strongly focusing on, on sales. So it's a less academic exercise than actually trying to open the right doors to get sales uh, working from a very, very pragmatic point of view, together with strategic um, considerations. Yes, and we have done quite a lot of projects over the years and have some certifications and even some of our sales methods are um, self-developed. Um, we are a member of the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce and work very closely also with Francesco and the whole team, Pauline and Amy. Um, we are also a member of the German-British Chamber of Commerce and have a lot of activities in this market. Again, I want to be very brief, uh, but I will, for example, be in London from tomorrow on and also speaking in the context of going global in Excel there. Now let's get to the to the first and and I think quite interesting topic because there indeed has been a lot of discussions. Um, what's what's the pulse of Germany right now? What's going on? Um, I think is 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 one of the first questions that many potential exporters or uh, businesses who are considering to enter into this market um, are looking at. Now. You see a lot of negative uh, articles at the moment for our Mr. Habeck, our still um, uh, Minister for uh, Economics. You know, uh, there has even been in The Economist recently, uh, I don't know if, if any of you know the, the discussion of the early 2000s where Germany was called the sick man of Europe and all that. Um, there, you know, and also a little bit of uh, government turmoil the last couple of days. So to, to, to really give you from the German market in Germany, where I'm right now, uh, yes, I would say that the German economy is somewhat weaker than it has been before. Um, that, that is clear. Um, but what we also have to look into is that Germany is not, uh, we are not very optimistic here. Our way of thinking is always to look at the problems and uh, people are very over worried. So that's, that's, the, that's how Germans are. And if you look at the facts, uh, official facts of where um, this economy is, then yes, in 2023, um, Germany had a small recession of uh, zero, uh, minus 0 0.3 GDP growth. And so, yes, there was technically a recession, but it was rather small. And until now, the expectations of 2024 is to have a minimal growth of 0 0.1. So if you ask me, I would say this is a yes stagnation and it's not good as such, but it's just how it is. Um, now, when we are looking at these trends, this is usually something that influences, of course, uh, Germany because we are... A, ourselves a strongly exporting uh, country, um, but it is not that important, I would pledge, when it comes to um, us importing um, services and, and products. Now, uh, a little bit on the, ex you know, explaining why, why have we come to where we are. There's many structural reasons, but uh, I would just like to point out that Germany is the only country in the world undergoing a major energy transformation, um, exiting nuclear energy and fossil energies at the same time, which is an enormous, uh, uh, you know, effort. And in 2023, already 52% of all electricity, not all energy, but all German electricity was already from renewables, which is relatively much if you look at that Germany still has many industrial structures. Um, now, the pressure, of course, uh, will make Germany more resilient in, in the long uh, run. And uh, I'm often asked by uh, UK companies, okay, so is it a bad time? Well, I, you know, <laughs> on the other hand, you could say that when German economy is uh, thriving, nobody needs a UK company, to put it quite plainly, right? I mean, uh, the fact that that there is a little bit of, of pressure uh, in the kettle means that uh, German companies uh, are forced to, to being more flexible, to being open to new solutions. Um, this is here again, just a brief energy chart where, where you can see that the renewables are, are going up. 
And by the way, also we have a we have a temperature um, measurement amongst entrepreneurs in Germany, uh, which is called IFO Business Climate Index, um, uh, which is um, regularly measured, and that is also stabilizing right now. So, as I said in the beginning, yes, there is a stagnation. It's not the best of the best, but that accounts for great and large parts of this world. Um, but you can also look at it in a in a slightly more constructive way, if you so like. Also, as a consequence here in this context, uh, German-British uh, business relations are constantly improving. I think that what we are doing right now is also a micro sign of that. Um, but I can tell you that uh, 15 years ago, we had almost no requests from, from your market. But today we get uh, requests uh, ongoingly to support uh, UK businesses here. And also, again, Germany is still the third biggest economy in the world um, with, um, you know, a position um, just after China and before Japan. Um, so UK would be number six on that list. Um, and I'm just mentioning this to show that there is still, you know, a lot uh, to be achieved. Um, and we see that that the relations between our countries is indeed improving. The German-British Chamber of Commerce just did a, a business outlook, uh, which can be found on, on the web as well, looking specifically at how the bilateral relations are, and they were very good indeed. So that was just a very brief uh, overview um, over the temperature. So um, if I look into what can I give you as, as, as tips today, or what is the maybe one of the essences of um, almost 20 years in, in this business, what to be aware of, there are a few tips that I would like to share here. And um, I would say for starters, um, the difference between how business is done in, in the UK and in, in Germany um, it's very, very different indeed. Um, oftentimes people think, okay, I'm just getting on a plane and, and doing business over there and all this, which can also be the case. Um, but um, what we have learned over time is that uh, there is a huge difference in business communication. Um, we in Germany are still if you like, very conservative when it comes to business communication. And in the UK, I, I will be in London tomorrow myself. And it's very much about, it's a verbal communication. It's about meeting people and having the right spirit and all that. Whereas in Germany, it's about writing, you know, a long email that is very systematic and has many bullet points. Um, I would not underestimate that. Another example, um, appointment scheduling is, is, is very different. Um, in, when I'm in the UK, it's often, say, spontaneous or driven by the moment and the idea and, and somebody knows you and then will they continue on to introducing you to others and so on and so forth. And here it can be an appointment that is many months in advance because Germans are not... Uh, spontaneous people <laughs> and arranging an appointment today for January or even the beginning of February is not necessarily a bad sign. On the contrary, it could even be an indication for that um, counterpart taking us very seriously and wanting to prepare and, uh, and research and so on and so forth. Also, again, we are just trying to damp the, the essence out of, of many, many projects, but decision-making processes differ um, very much from, from the two um, areas. So the German inertia, as I would call it, it's just, you know, it takes a lot of time to get into the German market um, or particularly now looking at the, the first section when uh, Germany um, is doing very well, Often we are confronted with, um, you know, people asking, are the Germans particularly arrogant? Well, I, I don't know, I, uh, you know, difficult to say, but they are indeed very leaned back because they have very long and reliable uh, procedures. Now, if the, there is a little bit of pressure in the system as we have now, that inertia might be, uh, be, be reduced a little bit, but... Um, it takes long to get into the accounts to win German clients. And what sounds like a disadvantage uh, 
can often turn out to actually becoming an advantage in the long run, of course, because if the UK business then actually gets in, um, they stay in the game for a long time and profit from that, which is different to other markets. We will hear about Scandinavia in a few minutes, but um, that can be different there. I would say a uh, fourth point here, facts over narratives. Um, this might sound strange, but in <laughs> when I'm in the US or in, in the UK, I often have the feeling that it's about being on an amazing journey. If you use the translated uh, words amazing journey in a business context in Germany people will look at you like what's that um, in Germany we talk about our machine having these and those properties and this and that reliability it's much more driven by um, say facts uh, as such and maybe a less um, exciting uh, marketing uh, communication um, so if if we take this and look at what would be concrete tips then we just looked at some of the um, of the acknowledgements that we have collected over the years we would always say look at your marketing because twisting it um, so that it's understood in Germany improves um, the the success rate uh, of doing business here. Um, very often we have to tell clients that uh, if you have planned in two months please add five or 10, um, that's again the inertia. It, it takes time here. Um, so, so that is definitely something, something to look at. Another tip is that uh, Germany is uh, pretty, um, in, pretty organized in terms of associations um, and there can be specific events um, that one is not aware of. Um, or small business magazines, and, and uh, we call them hunting grounds and habitats, in which my specific target audience might be organized or might subscribe and so on and so forth. And those can be very interesting uh, niches. This is also here of the German um, uh, organizations where there will be local, say, mechanical engineering associations in a, a diff, in a southwest part and northeast part of Germany and so on that oftentimes also UK businesses can become member of or going uh, to uh, to events uh, in um, to meet people in a much smaller uh, frame than if you go to the Hannover Trade Fair or something like that. Uh, this might surprise you that I say disregard ba language barriers. I think it's ridiculous to talk about uh, not being able to uh, speaking German. That's that doesn't play a role anymore, if I may say that so so clearly. Um, Germans have become much better. Uh, English schools are popping up everywhere here in Germany. Uh, so I don't really think that that's any issue. Uh, you can just approach uh, companies. And yes, of course, everybody will love to be in their mother tongue, um, but they should be um, sufficient in, in English here. And lastly, on the tip side here, um, strategy, strategy, and strategy. Um, if I look over time, which businesses have been successful entering this market, I can clearly say that the ones with a strategy, a long-term strategy, but that probably accounts not only for exporting and doing setting up business on the continent on and particularly in Germany, but for all business endeavors. But um, here it really distinguishes success from non-success to, uh, to, to planning and thoroughly reviewing the possibilities and the landscape on beforehand, adjusting oneself uh, and then executing this. Now, my last small impulse section for today. Again, this is all very condensed, but I hope that I can give some, just a few, an, an interesting overview at least. Um, now, if we turn all this around and say, so how can we actually do business with the crowds? I don't know if that term is used anymore, but um, that would be the that would be the, the in-route that um, our organization would have when supporting UK companies because in the end, it's not about academic exercises, it's about earning money. Um, so again, and I would like to, to, to even strengthen that argument. I personally believe um, that the crisis of the past years 
COVID, Brexit, Ukraine, energy and all that has actually imposed a wake up effect um, on, on many, uh, say, sleeping organizations in on the continent and in, in Germany. And on the other hand, uh, our, say, uh, assessment of the of the British way of doing business is much more creative, uh, positive, open-minded. You know, it's it's just rip it off and get on with it, um, uh, which I think uh, suits very well to where we are right now. So um, that I would recommend just to use the moment, the momentum that we have right now. Also, um, again, this is a little bit of balance of don't underestimate it, but also don't overestimate it. Um, sitting there and, and doing too much planning also is not really recommendable. Um, we always say that, you know, it has to taste well for the fish that we are fishing for, which would be the target um, companies and, and, and B2B business in the German market. So we would recommend to relatively early in the process to try to harvest first reactions um, from from the market. Um, so also into a certain extent, just do it, but but do it in a prepared way. That's basically what we say. And um, the word agile is, of course, also a very hyped one, and I'm reluctant to using it, but I actually think that it describes quite well what is necessary. Um, it's really this kind of, okay, I approach a German company and I harvest my first reactions, um, and then just seeing whether or not what I bring to the table is what they want to hear and whether or not the door is open in a way that actually leads to business, which, again, is, is what this is about. And this is just a very brief uh, graphic that we use in one of our sales processes where we always uh, in have a, a, a preparatory uh, sales testing. So we do what we call a contacting sprint on some industrial verticals because usually there can be several in the German market for particularly mechanic uh, and engineering uh, companies. Then we look at, okay, what are the performances? Then we run into the bigger uh, contacting and then we optimize again and again and again and again and even in longer standing projects that stretch over several years this is a continuous uh, optimization wheel that we that we keep um, you know analyzing and optimizing on um, from a say how do you do it from a, a project management perspective we would always say so prepare and here important is collect information, you know, um, depending on what kind of business you have, uh, look a little bit into the competitors, check these events and associations, as I just said, and indeed also check the, uh, the marketing. Um, we would then do this agile, say, toe dip of testing, um, just reach out to, to a handful, try to get into action. This could also be in the frame of a German uh, trade fair event. Um, and then we, we recommend coming to a natural halt after having uh, these cards on the table. This is also what we do in projects. And then to discussing, or one can do it oneself to say, okay, is what we have here sufficient? Is, are we, you know, is this a uh, ship sailing, so to speak, or would we need to amend messages or target groups and, and all these questions? Once this is done, and this is what we would call uh, the initial uh, project or the testing phase of, of every export uh, endeavor to Germany, then, of course, you can go into rolling it out, thinking bigger. Uh, the Again, the, the company lists that one can create in the German market are vast also due to the fact that there are so many companies in Germany. We count almost 3 million companies out of which uh, most are what we would call SMEs. So if I come to an end, also because my colleague is waiting, um, I suppose, just to recap the impulse of today, I would say that taking um, the temperature of the German market, yes, Germany is weaker than it has been, but this has also to do with structures and for a UK company, to put it quite bluntly, uh, the weaker Germany is the better from a, from a sales perspective because it induces the pressure from outside that they need to look for 
good, new, cheap, innovative uh, partners. Um, so there is more open-mindedness, if one can say so, than in good times. Um, well, concrete tips, uh, please do not underestimate the, the, the differences in uh, the business habitats. Um, this is definitely not, um, you know, this is not the right way to do it. Uh, but on the other hand, I would also say prepare well, look into it, but do not overthink it. Do the toe dip uh, if you have, if you can do a takeaway from today, then that. Um, and utilize this kind of wake up effect uh, that we currently have, not only by the way in Germany, but in many other markets. Um, I think this is this is really an exciting time to to going out there. Um, Everybody speaks English, or at least sufficient. Um, so um, bring your good products and services together with your British flexibility and innovation into this market, and your chances will be um, high to succeed. That was the impulse for today. Thank you very much, and um, I will remain for the Q&A session as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for the um, insightful presentation. Um, uh, just um, want to remember to the audience, if you have any question, uh, we have a dedicated uh, Q&A session um, at the end of the second presentation. So feel free to share um, any question you might have about the topics mentioned by this, uh, the speaker. Um, well, now, um, next, we are delighted to hear from uh, uh, Christopher uh, Landquist, who will guide us through the opportunities in Scandinavia, offering key insights into the region market and practical tips for uh, business looking to expand in that. Um, just uh, for your request, Christopher, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Francesco. Um, today, I'm going to be talking, let's move to the agenda straight away. Uh, first, I've got to give you a brief introduction to Scandinavia Connect. Um, it will be very brief as well, uh, like Tim shared. Um, then I'm going to provide some, uh, let's say, a snapshot of the trade statistics in the UK for their exports to the Scandinavian markets. Um, this will follow, be followed by economic status and outlook for next year. Um, after that, I will go through some of my reasons why companies should consider to expanding to the Scandinavian markets. Uh, this will be followed by some sectors of interest and these sectors are not an exhaustive uh, list of, of sectors. It's some time constraints in this presentation. So I will cover four sectors very briefly. Uh, after that, I will go through some common entry difficulties. Um, oh, sorry. Common entry difficulties that some past clients have shared before they contracted the services of Scandi Connect in these markets. And lastly, I will go through some, some methods and recommendations, how you can make the most of your expansion to, to the Scandinavian markets. So moving into Scandi Connect. So Scandi Connect function as a market accelerator for companies that want to expand to Scandinavia. So we do focus on, on actionable services that, that leads to results. Uh, and with that, we operate in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway uh, due to the similarities and cultural similarities in these countries. And sometimes we do projects in Finland as well, but there are a bit of language barriers, in Finnish language. And so it depends on the, the sector in the region if we do any work there. Uh, we do have experience from, from most sectors um we we work in in most of the sectors but we have a special experience and a network in manufacturing healthcare construction and technology in in general and um, we have about contacts in uh, roughly 100 business associations and clusters in the region which we do network with in in connection with projects to to get specific information about uh, a sector or to get introduction to local companies in the market as well. Um, and about the services, uh, they mainly uh, involve some kind of market research. So we, we focus a lot on the thorough preparations. We, we look for the competition side in the local markets. What, what can we learn from the competition? Uh, what channels are best to enter through? 
and also trying to find the competent competitive advantage for for our clients to best be able to to break through the the let's say the the competitive markets that the Scandinavian markets are. And um, with that, I would say that our strength lies in, in business development and sales, where we work very, very focused on, on enticing businesses, local businesses in Scandinavia to create an interest for our clients' products and services. Um, and we do so by, by uh, either doing a sales, sales as a service campaign or we do um, B2B meetings, introductions for our clients that they can meet with partners and end customers in the market to discuss uh, a co collaboration, basically. So the trade statistics, these are based on UK Department for Business and Trades latest release um, based on four quarters to the end of Q2 of 2024. So as you can see, there's been a decrease for the UK exports to all three markets between 5.3% until 8.9% until for, for Norway. Um, I think that the biggest factor for these decreases are the geopolitical tensions that we've seen um, in, in Europe and all across the world. I don't think that Brexit per se is, is a reason for these decreases in the last um, 12 months. Um, but I would say that I've, I've kept a let's say a close close eye to the Swedish market in particular uh, in this regard and and they say that although um, that brexit brought some some hardships on on dealing with imports of UK products they feel that the UK UK market is is too important of a trade partner to ignore in in that sense because the the quality of the products and innovation that comes from the UK uh, so it's it's a, it's a pill that they have to swallow to to continue to deal with uh, with the UK companies, and I think in total this brings the the exports to Scandinavia up to twenty around twenty eight. Uh, sorry, no, let let's move on. I lost that number. Um, so the economic status and outlook. Um, both Sweden and Norway. Have, have had a tough time for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, while the Danish market has has done a bit better than, than both Sweden and Norway. Um, so in Sweden, the forecast they expect that the GDP will grow by 1% for the, for the full year of this year. Uh, the economy will remain in a recession, uh, but uh, recovery is on the horizon with an expected growth of 2% for next year. And with that said, the industrial sector as well is looking to a 3.5 uh, increase for for next year, and it's a, it's an econ economic uh, cornerstone of the Swedish uh, Swedish market. So that's very positive. Um, then we have a weak Swedish krona. It's been weak for a couple of years now, but it's strengthened in the latter parts of of this year since. Uh, July, it's strengthened with about 6% against the dollar and about 4% against the euro. And this, this uh, strengthening is expected to continue for, for next year. Uh, and then the Norwegian economy experienced a weak growth since, since middle of 2022. And the krona, uh, the local currency in Norway, has also lost significantly uh, in value against most of its trading partner, which has been difficult for obviously for the companies that deal with imports of products in in this market. Um, Statistics Norway they forecast uh, a slight pickup with zero point five percent for next year, followed by a a more robust one point nine percent for twenty twenty six. And then we have the Danish economy it is currently historically strong with a with a strong uh, labor market. Uh, so they expect um, GDP growth uh, to reach 1.6% this year and it's uh, predicted to accelerate in, in next year in 2026 uh, with a growth of 1.9% and 2.9% respectively. So moving on to some suggestions why uh, companies should uh, consider expanding to Scandinavian markets. 
Um, so first of all, I would like to say that the, the markets themselves are, are quite small if you compare them to, to Germany, for example. But with the similarities they have, they, they're quite close connected. So it should be seen as a, a quite big and, and prosperous region in, in general. And for the government investment across many sectors, um, they do invest quite heavily in, in, in a lot of sectors, such as healthcare, in, in infrastructure, and also to digitalize the, the many industries in these countries, which are very important for, for the exports. Uh, as an example, I can bring up, um, you have Danish government allocated about 6.6 .6 billion um, euros in recent years to build eight so-called super hospitals to improve care in areas with larger populations. And this is something they continue to invest in. So that, that has brought a lot of uh, opportunities for, for exporters of uh, medical technology and digitalization for, for the healthcare. And then we have ease of, do, ease of doing business. So normally the Scandinavian markets are known for have, having stable uh, economies and, and a highly skillful skillful um, labor force um, and as as many of you might have experienced there, there will be a very few language barriers and also it's a cultural proximity i would say between the uk markets and and the scandinavian markets which are definitely uh, facilitating facilitating factors when you're trying to to reach into a new market and also, especially Sweden and Denmark are considered to be great markets to test a new product. Uh, and that would be especially for any kind of techno technological product or innovation. So they do have some uh, ecosystems in, in these markets where they include both the, the public and the private sector. So you have business associations and clusters uh, included with big companies, startups, and, and public funding. So they work together to, to facilitate the implementation of new technologies in, in these markets. So that, that's why, together with the fact that, that Scandinavian companies and people are early adopters of new technologies. So it is uh, two very ideal markets to, to do um, a testing of a new product or solution before approaching the European mass market in that sense. Uh, open for partnerships, so what does, does that mean? It means that uh, Scandinavian companies are open to collaborate with other companies to co-create a new product or to work together on a project. And at the same time, these markets are very competitive in nature, as I mentioned. So any new in innovation or product that can give the local companies a uh, um, further reach in the local market is something they will consider for, for the future. So they're very open to, to hear from, from um, qualitative uh, suppliers of, of new products and solutions to, to work together with them. And then you have import and export dependent countries. So that goes for all three uh, Scandinavian countries. Uh, as, as we are in a bit of a recession now, uh, especially in, in Sweden and Norway, it means that the, the export is very important for the country. So the industrial side, for example, they need to continue to produce, continue to invest in, in their production, um, especially to, to continue to import the intermediate goods that they need uh, to be able to, to produce their products and export. So even if we are in a recession, uh, the wheels of industry needs to keep turning in these countries. So, um, that's why it's it's never a, a downtime to to approach uh, companies in, in that sense. So some sectors of interest. I've I've gone through a bit about um, the technological um, sector, which is not really a sector in itself, but it's more something that um, permeates society and and the companies in in Scandinavia. So you have these ecosystems and and ideal test markets for new products. Um, I would say areas of interest is especially building tech at the moment uh, in Sweden. Um, I think Denmark and Norway are not too far behind uh, in the field of building tech and implementations of such. Uh, and then we have clean tech, which is big in, in all Scandinavian countries. 
So if you have a product in the in the area of clean tech, uh, this is the market for you to to go and and go on to for a European mass market after that. I would say. Uh, renewable energy. So the Scandinavian countries they produce about three quarters of their electricity needs from from re renewable energy. Um, you have the um, the landscapes for it. I would say both Norway and and Sweden they they are the leaders in in uh, wind energy. Uh, no, sorry, the Denmark, Denmark and Sweden are the leaders in, in wind energy. So you have open landscapes in Sweden, Sweden, which is also suitable for offshore uh, wind energy. And then you have in Denmark, the offshore wind, uh, wind energy industry is, is the leading sector there. Um, as for hydro energy, uh, Norway, rich in rivers and fjords, and also Sweden, rich in rivers, is suitable markets for any products within hydro energy. Um, as for healthcare, uh, I mentioned it's a lot of investments, uh, public investments for the healthcare in these countries. Uh, you have an aging population, so welfare tech solutions is, is very much spoken about, um, but you also have medical technology uh, for these markets and e-health as well, because there's a digitalization of, of uh, the healthcare sector that is ongoing. Mm, I would say that if you're planning to take a medical technology product into the market, it's better to partner up with a local company. Um, most of the hospitals, they, they deal with public tenders for, for all their needs. So, and these public tenders are very, very specific in nature. You need to answer the specifics of a tender and these local companies know how to do that and they also do lo lobbying work for uh, stakeholders both at the hospitals and at the municipal levels as well so it's good to have that local partner to do that work for you and then uh, uh, manufacturing sector uh, which i've talked briefly about uh, it provides about 20% of the GDP in both Sweden and Denmark. Uh, so it's very big, important sectors for, for these two countries. Uh, there are some drivers that that uh, is important in the industrial sector in Scandinavia right now. So you have the digitization, the transformation is, is ongoing for the industrial sector. So companies are increasingly working to digitize their their production basically, because these are high cost countries. So they need to be uh, very streamlined and uh, have an operational efficiency to be able to compete with the local countries in, in Asia. So they do invest in a lot of uh, digitization, robotics. Um, Sweden, for example, is the, is the fourth um, biggest um, user of robotics in, in, in the industry um, per capita, that is, of course. Uh, other other drivers are uh, nearshoring, so a lot of industrial companies are looking for closer suppliers um, to them. Uh, the chain in that from from previous having a lot of suppliers in in Asia, um, and then the price pressure has been also a uh, a thing that's been a bit concerning for the local companies. But as I mentioned, the the Swedish krona especially is is looking to increase, um, which is is very good news for for the industrial companies that that need to to import the intermediate goods uh, for their production. And here I've gathered some some common entry difficulties. Like I said, these are based on some experience from previous clients before they acquired the services of of Scandi Connect. So the first one, understanding the local market. Um, it's quite common that when we talk to companies that they do little due diligence, little research of the market before they approach potential partners or end customers. And it's difficult to optimize the potential doing that. Uh, also quite common that companies go to a trade fair in Scandinavia and they meet, uh, let's say a distributor and have a good conversation and then they sign the agreement straight away without any due diligence about that um, distributor. Uh, what, uh, what is their ex expertise? Do they have the 
the necessary reach in the market, for example. So it's it's something that we we push quite heavily to to do the research before approaching any companies. Uh, getting noticed and receive responses. So as well, a lot of companies that we talk to, they do an email campaign. They send out uh, emails to say 50 companies in the market, the standardized emails, uh, not very specific, and they won't get any responses doing that. So it's difficult to, to get in touch with a local company if there's not been um, an introduction of the phone or elsewhere beforehand. And then we have receiving valuable feedback. Uh, so Scandinavian people like to keep their cards close to the chest. Um, so when you're dealing with a company in Scandinavia, you sometimes need to ask for the feedback. You need to ask them specific questions for them to open up and share with, with you if, the, if, if they have any hesitations or what they think about your products or solutions. And then the last one is probably the most frustrating one, uh, moving the discussion forward. So some, some companies have had uh, a first meeting with, with local companies, companies in Scandinavia, and then the dialogue turns cold and they don't know what happened. Um, so they obviously think that they're not, they're not uh, interested anymore in the products or services that they offer, but it could be as well that the company in question haven't been specific enough uh, with what they expect going forward. So I will move on to some uh, methods and, and recommendations how to deal with these this setbacks, these, these hurdles. So uh, again, research your market thoroughly. Um, and I would say that starting with having a look at the local competition uh, teaches you a lot. Um, you can learn what is the best channel for you to, to enter. And you, you will also be able to develop your own competitive advantage when you see what you're up against in the local market. And it, it might not be the same way that it's structured in, in your home market or in other markets that you're, where you're present. Um, adapt your communication. So first of all, identify the decision makers. Um, in Scandinavia, decisions are taken in consensus. Um, so you need to consider when you go into a meeting, there might be, for example, four or five people in the meeting room. So you need to consider uh, each and every one of those four or five people because um, the most quiet one in that meeting room might, might be the one with the biggest, biggest pull in the company. Uh, so you need to deal with everyone in, in that meeting. Um, I would say that uh, it's a bit similar to what Tim explained about use a straightforward communication style and stay away from, from hyperbole. It's, it's not well received in Scandinavia. So a straightforward communication that is backed up by facts and that goes especially in the beginning. They want to examine the facts internally um, before they before they open up for a dialogue, and that's when you can um, talk a bit more freely about um, what you what you're planning to do in the market and, and what your your thoughts are. Um, number three, include them and listen actively. So, as goes for for a sales sales pitch, it's always good to include their company in in. Um, what you're trying to do in the markets. And, and that goes back to knowing your target market. So you, you know what the local distributors or sales partner that you're looking to connect to, you know how they work, you know what areas they, they operate in. So you're trying to introduce that in your, in your sales pitch. Then you're most, more likely to, to get, get a response. Um, and then build report and establish trust. Um, after, after the first meeting, um, you want to to create that trust because Scandinavian people are more likely to do business with you if they if they if you have created that trust for them. And again, you need to to talk about their company and and what you see your product can can do for them in the in the local market. Uh, move the conversation forward. Uh, decide what you want uh, before each contact. And I'd say that you should set that those steps out before the first contact. What do you want out from, from each uh, contact with the company, each meeting? 
and then you need to communicate that to to the company uh, what your expect expectations are because you, if you haven't done that the dialogue can go cold um and if you if you agree on the next step um that that you have an ex expectation you need to deliver this and we're going to prepare this then it's much easier to to get get forward in the in the dialogue because Scandinavian people don't like to to lose their face in in that sense that they don't they don't do what is being expected from them uh, and then pick up the phone so it's it's always good to do the first uh, introduction of the phone um I never send out an email because they don't get picked up if you haven't done that introduction uh, over the phone and you also it's also a good thing to do uh, do uh, the introduction over the phone because you never know if the one you're talking to is the decision maker as it is a a big group decision making unit for these companies they might be not the the most obvious decision maker that you should talk to so you need to lift pick up the phone and call the company and find the right contact introduce yourself and then as a follow up you send an email with with um with your your information your product catalogs and but then you should need to keep that short as well so you don't send a a big catalog of 50 50 pages because it won't won't be be opened up and then lastly uh, i would say to be consistent in your follow up um it is a bit difficult because it takes time for the companies to to come to a decision internally so you need to be consistent um, and follow up with them if they don't answer your emails pick up the phone or you can try to text them uh, send them a direct message on linkedin try in an, any channel that to see which one works best for for your contact And that's everything I had for today. So I want to thank you for your attention. I suggest we move on to the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you very much um, uh, for the uh, very insightful uh, presentation. Um, yes. Yeah, so now uh, let's open the floor for any question you have. Um, have anything you'd like to ask? Uh, feel free to say during the session. Um, I understand there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so um, I got a question actually uh, for both of you, um, the team. It's more um, regarding uh, e-commerce and digital platform. What role do different platform e-commerce play in the, both in the German and Scandinavian market? And if there are any specific online tools or strategies um, for UK businesses uh, should focus on when they would like to handle in the German market and Scandinavian market. If you have a, a quick tips or for, for UK business, just to, to, to answer this question. In terms of online marketing, you mean? Yes, yes, correct. Oh, uh, Francesco, a huge question. Uh, I would uh, say for the, for the German market again. I mean, we have also here, we have very big landscapes of, you know, it depends on what strategy is chosen. Are you going to the very big ones like Otto, Bauer, uh, ProID and what they are called? They have very different, uh, again, uh, decision-making processes as to the smaller ones and the medium-sized ones and the specialized ones. I know this sounds uh, uh, a little bit dire, but the German market is just so vast and, and big um, that no, I, I could not say that I would have for the German market a golden uh, tip aside from what I said bef on beforehand. Uh, it depends on, you know, looking at what kind of strategy do you have? What channels are you going into? What I can say is, of course, that the bigger German ones have very polished processes and that the entry itself is very difficult and, and has a lot to do with registrations and all these questions, whereas the smaller ones are more flexible. Thank you. Thank you very much, team. Uh, do you have any tips in this regard? Yeah, or... I mean, for, for Scandinavia, it's Scandinavia in, in general was an early adopter of e-commerce, so it's, it's a very mature market uh, in itself. 
I would say it's it's a good idea to build brand awareness in the market. So if you if you have a a products that that you aim to have in in a one of the bigger retailers or a big pharmacy or whatever it may be, it's a good um procedure to build brand awareness to get some sales up via e-commerce in the market. And then when you have that, you can approach um the biggest retailers and show those numbers to to start selling with those. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And second question I would like to ask, in your experience and also in your opinion, what, what are the common mistakes uh, that UK business makes when they uh, will say the top three and try to, to penetrate in the market of uh, your expertise? So in the manifest and in this kind of idea, if you would like to answer this question. Yeah, I think I think I went through the the mistakes in in my presentation, and those are not just for UK companies. Quite quite common mistakes for for any any country really. So I, I don't have anything specific just for UK companies for why they struggle. Do you have any any three common mistakes ready for uh, for discussion team? Well, I I. Again, I can endorse the same, but I would say indeed, I think the the underestimating the mechanisms of this uh, market, it, you know, wraps it really together, um, and and together with what I also try to emphasize, the, the marketing differences. Um, if if companies underestimate the way that their target audience thinks in Central Europe, they will be less successful than they are in the Anglo-American sphere. Uh, and and I think that this is one of the most common mistakes that that companies do. By the way, not only smaller players, right? I mean, we all remember maybe Walmart. Walmart is, of course, a huge company uh, with endless resources, um, and they tried um, to enter the German market. And despite of all their resources, they they um, didn't succeed because they, in the end, didn't get what the German consumer wanted because they hadn't done. Uh, you know the, the the due diligence on it, and and basically it was a if you ask me, a communicational strategical mistake of assuming that uh, ways in other markets can be transferred to the German market, which they never can. Um, so uh, so yeah. Yes, that's uh, what I was looking for. Uh, example. Uh... <laughs> Thank you both uh, for answering uh, my question. I think uh, we don't have any any question from the from the audience. Uh, so thank you uh, all of you for joining us today. Uh, we uh, uh, you enjoyed the session. I found it insightful. Uh, our next webinar uh, in the international trade week series will be. Um, in Africa will take place tomorrow and uh, we look forward to welcoming you again um, if you have any question or need uh, any further information uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch uh, we also appreciate if you could take a moment to complete uh, our feedback form which will help us to better understand your needs and improve our future sessions uh, you can uh, simply scan the QR code uh, or um link when uh, you'll get the slides after after uh, uh, session uh, finish uh so yes simply on the qr code to share your thoughts and thank you once again and uh, we hope to see you tomorrow and other webinars this week thank you very much thank you christopher i thank you team for uh, your uh, insightful presentation and um uh, Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank for you. Having us. Thank you.